Good morning. Today, we are going to entertain ourselves with membrane proteins. This is largely a continuation. Well, this is the third class of proteins that I told you about on Wednesday. Um, and it's also the big law of love both of my group and most groups at DVB, Biophysics and Biochemistry at Stockholm University. They're fun. Um, the problem with a book on this topic is that 15, 10 or 15, year, 15 years ago, when Alexei wrote this book, and I would even argue most textbooks, we knew, I wouldn't say that we didn't know anything about membrane proteins, but our knowledge of this field is expanding so insanely rapidly that there are virtually no textbooks whatsoever that keep up with it. So I'm not really going to talk about research here. Depending on how much time we have later on in the course, I might spend one lecture on research topics in the department and everything and what people are working on. But there are going to be quite a few relatively new results here. But before we do that, I figured let's go back to our discussion items and spend some time on the globular and fibrous proteins. 12 questions, shorter today. You lead the discussion, pick the questions, and try to answer them. And then we'll see if I have any comments. Mm, name a couple of fibrous proteins that you So where do you find it? Bone and yeah. other building blocks. And myosin and muscles. Right, so that's true. And, and uh, so, so what's common for all these proteins is that A, they're, what you mentioned, all the three things you mentioned, they're items that are so large that you can actually see them, not just with a microscope, but without a microscope even. And that's what makes them kind of unique. This is not really something that is used in biotechnology today, but I bet one could imagine starting to use biological building blocks even to form slightly larger structures. So we talked a little bit about things like potentially using artificial proteins for organs or something, right? And in principle, you could probably create a complete heart or something that, uh, well, you couldn't create a heart, but you could create something with the shape of a heart that then had protein material on it, and hopefully these would then be proteins or something that didn't throw off the immune defense. Um, certainly not possible today. Another problem is that if you ever get to the point where you would like to create organs or something, you would also need them to do something. So just creating something like a blood vessel is probably easier. But potentially a pretty cool way of forming building blocks long term. Yes, so it's, and, the, and it's a bit stupid in a way, right? Because the name mostly has to do with the shape, but when we say globular, it's, it's not that, first, all globular proteins aren't really spherical, but this name came up before we knew so many protein structures, um, and it's very hard to change. But, but the point of them is really that they're water soluble, and that has some sort of uh, relation to the shape, but it's not super strong. So what's the difference between those protein types and membrane proteins? You can forget about membrane proteins since we're going to talk about that today. Fibrous are much simpler and often repeating hierarchical structures. Yes, so they're larger, they're hierarchical, but there is also something they don't have that globular proteins typically have. Well, I would say well-defined specific functions, right? Remember when we spoke about globular proteins, you had all this beautiful, and that's why, I can, that's why I said that fibrous proteins are kind of boring, it's just bricks, right? Well, globular proteins had all these beautiful things that they can bind groups, they do things, they transport oxygen. Globular proteins are very biological in the sense that they do things in the body. Uh, the uh, fibrous proteins, that's just building material. We need both, but... No, there are, th there are certainly enzymes that are affixed to, membrane pro uh, to membranes. Um, although, in general, the, you know, as we're going to see today when we talk about membrane proteins, 
What is the reason for having a membrane protein in a membrane? Right, usually that it's, as you're gonna see, these are slightly more complicated proteins. You need to transport something, you need to do something. And there's usually no specific reason why you absolutely need an enzyme to be attached to a membrane wall, right? There are a couple of examples like that, and that's usually because they're involved in some process that occurs very close to the membrane. But in general, most enzymes are small and globular proteins, and that's a very good question, by the way. So how does an enzyme work? I know we haven't talked about it, but any guesses? Based on what you know about proteins and thermodynamics and barriers this far? Yes, so it has to do, it's gonna have to lower an energy barrier, right? Because an enzyme is what? A catalyst. So in general, an enzyme, you know, I need to be a little bit careful with the nomenclature, but the catalyst can't be consumed itself as part of the process, right? So catalyst, after the entire process is done, we must still have the catalyst. Occasionally, the body still uses ATP, not for the process itself, but to somehow prepare the catalyst. But so how could you imagine this reaction works? If you have a couple of source compounds or that you want to do something with a process you want to catalyze, a reaction you want to catalyze. Right, so, so we usually, the reason why you have an activation barrier or something in a reaction is usually that before you have, for instance, again, if you have two compounds and you want to fuse them to create a product or something, you need to form a chemical bond, for instance, right? Once that has bond is formed, it's going to be beautiful because it's stable and nice. But while forming that bond, you're going to need to say, for instance, to push, push two charges very close to each other or for whatever reason, put these two molecules in a conformation that's pretty unfavorable. Otherwise, it would just be downhill. So what an enzyme usually does is that it binds the two molecules and stabilizes them so that it is possible to put them very close together because you have lots of other groups around them. This will then make it easier for these two residues, i.e. lower the energy barrier. So they will form the bond and then they will be released again. But we'll come back to how enzymes work later. Very cool proteins. So we got one and two this far, and three, and three. Uh, four, Rossman four, is it beta, alpha, beta, alpha, beta? Yes. And how is it that, so that it, it's a secondary structure, sorry, it's a super secondary structure where you alternate between strands and sheets, and how are they then organized three-dimensionally? Well, it's not so much circle form, right? But that they go back and forth so that all the beta sheets for all these beta strands form one contiguous beta sheet. Uh, so it's not that you it's not that you literally mix individual helices and uh, and strands because then those strands would not be stabilized by anything. But really, that you have one layer of strands and then one layer of helices. And if you take a fold like that and turn it uh, all the way around so that you have a small barrel of beta sheets and then helices around it, that's typically called a Tim barrel. It's actually another, but that's not just a secondary structure. That's an entire fold. So while we're at it, what, it's a, what is a Greek key? It's a small loop that is surrounded by the big one without uh, breaking the sequence. Yes. So this is a similar super secondary structure for beta sheets. It's by far the most common super secondary structure for beta sheets. So why do we introduce this concept of super, super secondary structure? And that's really the same way why we introduce secondary structure, right? Because remember these plots I showed you with tons of atoms all over the place. Proteins are complicated. It's too difficult to make sense of proteins if you're going to try to define and discuss proteins in terms of the location of every single atom or residue. So the reason for having these terms is that it makes it possible for us to talk about common concepts without going into all the gory detail about the amino acids and everything. So for instance, when somebody talks about a Greek key, you already know roughly what type of beta sheets we're talking about and what this type of structure might be able to do. While the Rossmann fold, as I mentioned, that there's frequently small binding sites at the edge of the sheet or between the sheets and the helices or something. Uh, 
So if you're a skilled structural biologist or working with drug design, the second you identify these things, you can usually start to almost guess where the binding sites might be before you have any functional data whatsoever. So it saves time really for you. Six, how do beta sheets influence dimerization? Yeah, well, so the idea is that you frequently have a molecule where you have one small beta sheet in each molecule, right? But at some point, you have an end of a beta sheet. And there are going to be a bunch of potential hydrogen bond partners that when you have the isolated protein in solution, these form hydrogen bonds with water. If you now take two of these sheets together, they can let go of their hydrogen bonds with water and just form one long sheet that continues from one monomer to the other monomer. That is by far the most common way proteins interact, if they're going to interact fairly strongly. It's much, imagine two alpha helices, right? There aren't really any free hydrogen bonds in alpha helices. There might be some side chains, but an interaction between two alpha helices will in general be pretty weak. That's not bad. Occasionally you want weak interactions, um, say hemoglobin, the four subunits. But if you want a really strong interaction, it's awesome to have these strong hydrogen bonds, like 510 hydrogen bonds in a beta sheet. So all this relates to seven. What is a fold? And what, perhaps just as important, what is a fold knot? So right, you could argue, or a three-dimensional organization, or what you mathematics typically call a topology of something. So topology would be the way, for instance, if you take a knot, and if you make a knot with a piece of string, right? There are, actually mathematic, there are actually mathematical ways of describing, for instance, a bow tie knot, a bow line knot or something. You might do this with several different types of string. You might do it in several different ways. One knot can be a mirror of another knot, but mathematically it's the same concept. So that's an even higher description rather than... Now, of course, in biology we don't, we don't use the mathematical descriptors, but this could rather be, for instance, something that has six alpha helices in a particular conformation or something. But what is it not? based on what you know about bioinformatics that you might suspect. If two proteins share the same fold, does that mean anything? It might, do. It might mean what? Uh, they might be homologs. They might be homologs, yes. But there is absolutely no guarantee whatsoever for it. And of course, if two proteins share the same fold, they might have similar functions. Uh, but it does not imply that they are evolutionary related. So this is frequently an example of what you call convergent evolution. Did you talk about that in bioinformatics? That some very, in particular, small, simple folds, as I mentioned, there are only ballpark of a thousand folds. So nature has to reuse folds, even if things are not evolutionary related, because they're small, stable. And this is interesting. I don't think, I'm not sure I talked about that, because this starts to be interesting. Remember. At the beginning of this course, we started to talk about does any protein, sorry, does any sequence fold into a protein? And here we start to see that there are possibly only a thousand folds in nature, maybe two thousand. So that kind of reduces the problem, right? The question is, if you pick any sequence, either it's going to have to be stable in one of those fifteen hundred folds or so, or it's not going to fold. Now this actually turns out to be an astronomically small fraction of proteins that are stable in one of these 1500 folds. So if you just go into the lab and make general sequences, you're going to form lots of beautiful molten globula that is just collapsed sequences, but they're not going to be stable proteins. So nature has evolved our genomes to contain sequences that do form stable proteins. Can we learn from them to actually like to make better simulation? Um, so that depends a bit on what you mean, what you're learning and simulating. So of course, when we talk about protein design and protein engineering, for instance, if you have a choice, would you try to create a new fold or would you try to reuse an existing fold? If you if you not need to design a new protein that does whatever process, an enzyme. 
something that an enzyme does, does not exist in nature to catalyze some important biotechnology process that will be the foundation of a new $10 billion company. Would you try to design a new fold from scratch or would you try to reuse an existing fold and get an existing fold to catalyze your process? Right, because unless you reuse, you're going to be dead. There's no way on earth you will ever be able to invent a new fold that's stable. Well, I wouldn't say that. that people have done it, but it's, it's an exceptionally steep uphill battle to try to create new folds. And since nature, again, pick any of these folds, you will likely find at least 50, if not 100 different functions for a particular fold. So nature, the fold is really the organization of the protein in which the amino acids are stable. Depending on the specific residues, one fold can have a ton of different interactions. So it's certainly possible, remember those four helix bundles I showed you. Technically a four helix bundle is a small fold. But you saw at least three or four different ways that that could work. And then we realized you might be able to design a protein carrying hemoglobin by using a four helix bundle. So pick something small and simple. Why shouldn't you pick something large and complicated? It's hard to do, right? And in particular, the, the actual folding kinetics, the process by which this fold is going to be so much more complicated. If you just have four helices, either they are stable together or they aren't stable together. And if you put lots of residues there that makes them form really super stable helices, they are going to be helical. If you have a 1500 residue protein that would have four different subunits and F4, sorry, four different domains, you won't have any idea how it's going to fold in the first place or how these different domains are going to interact or anything. And that's kind of the same way nature does it. Um, what is more complicated, your proteins or a bacterial protein? A bacterium is much smarter. Because you keep carrying all these extra cargo to do complicated interactions such as the nervous system or anything. Bacterial proteins are small because they're optimized to be efficient, not to be smart. Learn from bacteria whenever you can, much better. We'll get to consciousness maybe today, actually. We'll see if I have time for it. Yes? This question was going to be, like, what's the smallest fold you can get? Is there a definition of, like, the smallest fold? Is it something that excludes water? Uh, so that, that's a good question. Well, when we talk about fold classification first, fold classification kind of gets important when you start having many folds, right? So when you talk about the smallest fold, I would, I would argue that this depends on who you are. If you're a biologist, you would say that, you know, anything that's a smaller than 100 residues or something, that's just a polypeptide. It's not a real protein. Ignore it. Now, of course, physicists, on the other hand, they love these small, simple toy systems because, well, that's kind of the whole point of physics, right? Reduce it until the point that it's, you should always reduce as much as possible, but never more. So that this eventually comes down to what you mean by a protein. When is something a protein? When is something a protein versus just a polypeptide? Yes, and I would say so that something is a protein when it can have a fold in the sense that it has one stable configuration that it always reaches, right? On the other hand, you could argue that if you have five residues in an alpha helix, is that a protein fold? Doubtful, right? That's a piece of secondary structure. So what the definition that we tend to use is that once you have a sequence that's large, sorry, a sequence or fold, if we call it that, a structure that's large enough that there is going to be one or more residues that are completely buried, not accessible to water. Then you have, you have an inside of the protein, even if it's just a single residue. So for, uh, I think for the last decade or so, people have argued that the smallest protein we know is this TRP cage, which is a tryptophan cage. So there's one tryptophan residue in the middle of a sequence, and when this folds, this tryptophan is not accessible to water. So you have lots of other residues around it. And from a biology point of view, this is an exceptionally unremarkable and uninteresting protein. But from biophysics or folding concept, then you can learn a lot from it, how it folds. Which of these classes of proteins has the largest diversity? So apart from memory proteins. <laughs> yes. And that's... In particular, because building blocks have to be fairly simple, right? Because the whole point of building blocks is that simple structure and use them hierarchically. And there are way more functions than globular proteins. Membrane proteins, it's a good question. What do you think? Are they more or are they simpler or more complicated than globular proteins, both in terms of function and structure or anything? 
Yes, yeah, so you think that they're going to have to be slightly simpler? Or more regular, or restrictive. Yeah. That's a very good idea. Um, I'm not going to tell you the answer. Think more about it. We'll, we'll cover that later today. I would have agreed with you uh, 10 years ago. <laughs> not sad. It's worse than that. I did a, I, I've actually written that in a bunch of research applications 15 years ago. Um, we'll come back to membrane proteins. 9, 10, 11, and 12 are the ones we have remaining. I'll let you pick them. Alpha slash beta are where they're intermixed, like alpha then beta, alpha beta. And alpha plus beta is where you have a string of alpha and then a string of beta. Right, and if you think about three-dimensionally, that would mean what? In alpha slash beta, the each beta strand would form a larger beta sheet. Yes, but it's still really mixed. It's typically mixed in the same. So if you have you have a small domain that contains just alpha, both alpha helices and beta sheets, although they're mixed in the sequence, but they're also very close to each other in space. But this type of protein would frequently be what? Completely different domains, right? So you might have a membrane protein that is alpha helix in the membrane, and then outside the membrane you have a domain that's full of beta sheets. You're actually going to see one of those today. Supersecondary structure I already talked about, so that's just really a concept to identify these very, very common, fact, uh, common patterns that are reused. 11 and 12. Mm, silk protein isn't expensive. Good. <laughs> silk protein isn't expensive at all. Uh, you can buy it a ton of it, for probably a couple of dollars or something. Now, if you put it in a shampoo, for some reason the shampoo becomes very expensive. Uh, and that's pure marketing. Uh, 12. What's a permanent wave? That is, <laughs> it wouldn't be the hair one. <laughs> it's when you uh, break and reform um, disulfide bridges. Yes. And so that you, you first reduce the disulfide bridges, that makes the hair very floppy and, uh, and soft, and then you oxidate them again. And that means that you have now, if you keep the hair in a, or hair or whatever, either in the curls or just comb it out, when you then reoxidize the disulfide bridges, that's actually going to fixate the hair in that form for a while at least. And that's pretty much exactly the same thing as you do in biochemical studies when you call that you cross-link proteins. So if you want to find out if two parts of a protein are two parts of a protein, if you want to find out if they're close together in an experiment, what you typically do is that you introduce cysteines. And when you have these cysteines, you can create a small disulfide bridge by oxidizing. And if you created a small disulfide bridge, say, between two parts of a protein that should move, suddenly they won't move anymore. So this is a fairly nice way of doing some engineering to understand the structure of a protein, even if you don't really know what the structure is. Because for this, we only need a sequence, right? You can guess that two parts should be close in structure, but you don't need to know the structure. Good. Let's get on to membrane proteins. Um, Membrane proteins are almost entirely alpha helical. Actually, that's not true. Well, it is true, kind of. Uh, most membrane proteins are alpha helical. There are some beta sheet membrane proteins in a barrel shape. Um, I'm not sure if I have any pictures of that. Let me get back to that later on today. In the ballpark of 25 to 30% of all the proteins in a cell are either inside the membrane or they're associated to the membrane in the sense that they're bound on the membrane surface. You would not believe this when you look in the protein data bank. For a long time, when I, when I was your age, I think there was one membrane protein structure in the protein data bank. Now there are probably 200 different structures. That doesn't mean 200 different folds. Because the second people manage to determine one fold, there is shortly 15 or 20 structures of it, right? So I, there's probably a dozen or maybe two dozen different membrane proteins folds. It's a much, much more restricted landscape. And that's simply because they're very, very hard to determine structures for. Why is that? Yes. So these exist in oil, right? And it's pretty hard to crystallize oil or fatty acids. Um, there might be 2% of structures, but this is the reason why they're important. It's 50% of all drug targets. If you think that is high, I've heard numbers, and I should add that to the slide, that it's 75% of the revenue on the drug market are drugs targeting membrane proteins. Because some of the really old drugs, such as aspirin or so, are fairly unspecific functions. Modern cool drugs against cancer or something, they frequently hit membrane proteins. 
So if you're in a pharmaceutical company, it's more likely that you're working on membrane proteins than that you're not. And that's because they're typically so important for signaling or so they do something very specific. For a very long time, both I and many other people used to argue that membrane proteins might conceptually be simpler than uh, globular proteins. And the reason for that is that we have the membrane as some sort of external boundary condition here, right? If you have an alpha helix, an alpha helix really needs to go from one side of the membrane to the other side of the membrane. Why is that? Can't it stop halfway? Why would it be bad for an alpha helix to stop halfway in a membrane? Right. Remember that you have all these peptide bonds here, right? And an unpaired peptide bond, that would, then you would have a partial charge right in the middle of a hydrophobic environment. That's astronomically bad. Nature hates that. And that's why you end up having these extremely regular patterns of 20 amino acids, which is initially, if any of you try to do predictions of both uh, membrane protein uh, topology in the bioinformatics course, this is pretty much why it works, right? Because you always, you need 20 residues to go to the other side all the time. So even if you start being very uncertain whether this might or might not be an alpha helix, if you are going through the membrane, you will go through to the other side. So then friend of order could say that that's great. They're just alpha helices, at least most of them. And if you have these alpha helices, virtually all of them are going to be pretty much straight. So you don't have these large crossing angles. And then it's just going to be a matter of deciding how these, whether one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, it's a GPCR, how these alpha helices pack together. Much easier than a general protein folding problem. It's a really good argument. I've used it in real research applications that actually were funded. The only problem is that it's wrong. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about structure prediction. And sorry, the I talked about structure prediction. That's pretty much the reason it works. I likely won't talk about GPCRs, but I'm going to talk about drug design and then I might talk to you about GPCRs next week. What is this? So you were almost right. This is a fatty acid, and this is a fatty acid. Uh, this is a lipid. These are the coolest molecules you can imagine. They are so undervalued in life. From many points of view, these molecules are cooler than proteins. Now, I have to confess that I'm slightly biased here because I spent five years during my PhD studying lipids, but they are remarkably cool molecules. So what type of protein is this? It's not a protein at all. Oh, sorry, sorry, yes. Uh, so why are these important compared to proteins? Well, from one point of view, they're not. They're not really, we typically, well, we include them in biochemistry occasionally, or at least organic chemistry, but it's not really a biomolecule in that sense. It's not a molecule, it's not built in your ribosome. It's not built from DNA. Where do these come from? You eat them, right? And, and it's not just that you, you, of course, you eat proteins too. You eat food, protein, digest the amino acids. These amino acids are used to build other amino acids. But these fatty acids you get pretty much directly from a hamburger or something. Be careful what you eat. Uh, you are what you eat, literally. The cool thing with that, as an individual molecule, it's kind of boring. Uh, it doesn't really have much structure at room temperature because these tails are exceptionally floppy. But the cool thing is that they have average order if you put them together, say, in a micelle or vesicle or membrane. This is a really boring way to show it. And this is how, well, I guess we would have showed this 20 years ago. But you know better things than that. So we can actually, let's look at some simulations of lipids so we can see how these molecules behave. Um, so this is a, this is actually not a single lipid. I'm only showing a single lipid, but this is a, par a lipid that is part of a large membrane. So you have lots of neighbors around it, but I'm only showing one lipid. And this is also a fairly short time. I'm only showing one rotation. This entire tail is very disordered and it moves. So this was like two picoseconds or something. In a nanosecond, the tails are going to be flying all over the place. You have a large head group here, but there isn't really any specific structure in the head group either. So these molecules, they have average ordering when they are together. That here the chains are relatively ordered and very far down the chains are very disordered. 
And this is a dipole. You have a minus sign, the phosphate, and the plus sign, nitrogen there, that goes, that always, almost always points up just so slightly. But it's, so the cool thing with this is individual molecules, they're completely dead and boring. But as a collective of molecules, they start to form all these shapes, cells, compartments, and everything. So I think this is a movie that I at some point borrowed from a colleague or internet. Uh, let's see. This movie is bad, and I'm going to see if you can find oh, it's bad. So this is a cell. It's just a computer animation, of course. And then you're zooming in on the membrane, and then you're going to see the lipids in a bit. And then there is some corny speaker voice that I've removed. But the whole idea is that it's, it's exceptionally flexible, right? And I think it's going to hit it harder. Yes, you can even hit it so hard that it breaks. But the cool thing, even at that, even if it breaks, lipids will actually heal themselves and reform. I'll get back to that in a second. And a real membrane contains not only lipids, but lots of things like cholesterol, sugars, and many of these things on the surface of the membrane is actually what you recognize as antigens or binding sites on the surface of the cell. There are a couple of things. So first, why do membranes heal each other, heal themselves so well? Why do they form in the first place? Less free energy for what? Well, uh, from one point of view, it's a really good answer that <laughs> there was apparently lower free energy to go in that direction. So of course they went there. But why is it lower free energy? What, what is the reason why they form and why do they form this way? Right. Do so you remember that we talked a little bit how much it costs to solve it one CH2 group, for instance, in water? Like you have 15 CH2 groups in each chain. It's, at a rem it's an exceptionally large hydrophobic surface here. So trying to expose just one of these to water would be very unfavorable, and here you have hundreds of thousands of them. But if you turn the hydrophobic parts against each other and then just expose the charged parts to water, because that's the other part, as I say, there are, full, there are effectively one full minus charge and one full plus charge here. Putting one of those charges in the middle of the membrane would be just as bad. So this creates a very nice stable membrane or lipid bilayer here that if disrupted or something, it will literally heal itself. It's flexible. What type of molecules can you tra transport through this one? Could you get water through? Well, you can. You can always get water through. The question is how high the free energy is. <laughs> so if you, if, you pick a, if you pick a small patch of a membrane or something, uh, something that you could simulate, could you see a water going through it in the simulation? Well, if you simulate for like one second of real time, pretty much, you can pretty much forget about it. It's eat my left shoe territory. Water does not go through this because water is so polar. The problem with this picture and most textbooks is that they have drawn the lipids completely in the wrong way. All beautiful parallel tails. They're perfectly ordered like an army or something. That is not actually, that is how a set of lipids look if it's a crystal or liquid crystal, not in your body. So in your body, things will look rather like this. And this is actually, this is taken from a simulation. So you see this is complete chaos. So this is like a liquid hydrocarbon on the inside. And this is something we've largely learned from simulations that it's exceptionally chaotic. A real uh, membrane in a, in a cell would also have tons of different lipids and everything. You would have cholesterol bound. Um, cholesterol actually makes the uh, membrane slightly more rigid. I can probably show a picture of that on Monday. Sorry, I should have included that today. And then you have these head groups here that are full of charges, and this acts as a very efficient boundary here against the water. So here you have water, but you have virtually no water whatsoever here. And this stuff like 10 nanoseconds or something. So the problem here is that there is no structure here. There is literally no structure whatsoever. You can't, well, you can crystallize it, but if you crystallize that, you would get a completely different uh, conformation. So this structure you can't crystallize. But on the other hand, the order isn't random either, right? We know that there is water here, there are head groups here, and there are, there's hydrocarbon in the inside. So how do we know this? In this case, it's a simulation, but how do we know my simulation is right? Well, you can still do experiments on it. So the reason why X-ray crystallography works 
is that you're scattering things from a molecule and hopefully get a beautiful three-dimensional structure based on how much electrons you scatter. You can try to do similar experiments here by scattering either x-rays or neutrons or something against these systems. The only problem is that since they're so flexible and floppy and everything, you only get a very small number of structure factors. So you can get some information about the average order like this. And this is based on really on electron density. So you can show that you have lots of water out here. This is the center of the membrane. So you have lots of water out here. The green part would be the positive group in this case, the choline. The phosphates are slightly further in. The carbonyls are these CO groups that connect the head groups to, the, to each tail, really. And in the middle, you have the tails. And it turns out you can actually separate CH2 from CH3 groups by marking them with, you mark the hydrogens with deuterium or something. So we have a fairly good idea about the average order. And here, too, you see there is no water whatsoever on the inside. They are, they are very hydrophobic. Based already on this plot, could you guess what residues you're going to see here and what residues you're going to see here in a membrane protein? Because this is still part of the membrane. Yes, but what goes where? <laughs> Sorry? Pol yeah, so polar residues here, right? And hydrophobic residues there. It's a pretty good guess. What if you were to try to put something in here? Let's, let's be extreme. Let's put an eye on here. Yes, like plus 20 kcals per mole. Based on that, you can calculate how likely relatively it is to, it is to see that one there. How would you do that? compared to having the same water. Yes. How many KT is 20? Yeah, 20 K. K. Is yeah, so say 30, 35 KT or something. So e to the power of 35 minus 35 which is like, I think I've written that 3 times 10 to the power of minus 15. And this is, again, what I consider eat my left shoe territory. It's not going to happen. Sorry. If you see that in a structure, if you see something like that in a structure, what do you say about that structure? It's wrong. Something went really wrong there, but you're smart enough to realize that there's no way that can happen. Um, but this leads to another problem. How do you, what do you do if you were, at some point, you will, well, I'm not sure about your cells, but I certainly have ions and charged proteins on the inside of my cells. And so at some point, we're going to need my, all the amino acids that I get from food. At some point, I'm going to need to get them into the cell. So to the body, this does pose a bit of a problem. It's good in a way, because if anything could get through your membranes, we would be dead, right? The membranes provide some sort of compartmentalization. But we still need to be able to get things selectively through the membrane, or nothing will work. And for a long time, this was a bit of a problem because, well, obviously there are things that help us do that, proteins in particular, but we couldn't really determine any structures of them. So we knew that membrane proteins were super important, but we couldn't really determine, we couldn't learn anything from them. We could just get very low resolution indirect data. And this is, of course, why they're cool and why lots of researchers have spent huge amounts of time on it. When do you think we got the first membrane protein structure? bit earlier, 1980s or so, I would say. Um, and uh, this is a sequence. So one of the first really important structures that came in the 1990s was this small protein. Um, this is a very special protein in archaea called bacteriorhodopsin. Um, and it's part of something called a purple membrane. So these, mem these bacteria, if you dry them out, they have a membrane that, so I should have had a picture of that. But that, you can search for purple membrane. It literally looks purple when you have it in a dish. The reason for that is not that the membrane is purple, but this membrane is so full of, the gray stuff here is lipids, all the red stuff is the protein. It's so full of protein that it's more, is this a membrane with protein in it or is it protein with a bit of lipid in it? I guess it depends on your definition, right? Like 50% of the mass or so in this membrane is really protein. So it's the protein that makes it purple, not the lipids. The reason for that is that you probably think of membranes as these large bilayers, right? And then with a protein here and there. This is a much better approximation of a real, for real uh, membrane. There is way more protein than you think in them. At least 30%, but sometimes more. 
What this protein appears to do is that it converts light energy photons to electrical and chemical energy. So it somehow pumps protons across the membrane that creates a load. And the way it does that is that you have a photon hitting. So this is the protein. And you can kind of imagine that the membrane is here, right? There is this purple chain, which is called the retinal group. And when a photon hits that one, you have an isomerization. So you have a double bond in the middle of this group that suddenly changes between from trans to cis. So the photon uses the photon energy to kick this group up to a higher, relatively unfavorable state. And then when this falls down, this protein is going to change its conformation a bit. And that helps us to move a proton across the membrane, which is really a charge. Protons are typically moved as part of water rather than isolation. Or you might move it as part of a sequence of different titratable residues, which you do in this case. You see all these residues that are titratable. So one residue here can donate a protein to another. And that way, you can effectively, it's not really going to be the same proton perhaps, but effectively you end up with one more proton on the side here and one less protein on the other side. Is this what they use in optogenetics? I'll get back to that in a second. Um, the cool thing with bacterial rhodopsin is that by now we have a bunch of different structures. At first sight, they're all the same. There are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven helices. But can you start to spot some differences here? Right, there's a kink and there's maybe a helix that moves slightly closer to another one. There are some conformational differences in this residue. There are some residues that point in different directions. And this is really how you understand any type of biology. You need structural information is awesome, but even when you see the structures, I'm not sure about you. For, to me, it's not entirely obvious what this does just by seeing the structures. There are a number of ways you can get data from this. You can even use, say, you can even use X-ray data and then use choppers. You have super short pulses of uh, X-rays, uh, femtoseconds or so even, and then you can have a flow. Oops, you, then you can have a cell where the membrane protein flows through here, so that the laser hits the membrane protein, and then we somehow measure the scattering or something a very very small time later. And that means that you essentially get a time-resolved X-ray experiment. Because if this protein, say, moves with a certain distance per millisecond, if you hit it with a laser, and then you take a measurement a small piece later when this protein has moved just so much that you know that you're measuring the protein one millisecond after the laser struck it, the structure you're going to get is a structure that corresponds to the state one millisecond after being hit by the laser, right? So that although you can't really, you can't directly, an x-ray experiment is an average, so you can't directly have an x-ray just take a picture in one millisecond. But this way you can actually get time-dependent structural information. There are lots of, this is a fairly advanced such experiment, but there, this just stopped flow or continuous flow methods is a very common way to getting things time-dependent. In general, the problem with many of these experiments is that it's hard to get super high resolution data because you're not going to have a crystal or anything. But by looking at the scattering as a function of wavelength, there are, you, can, you can start to study features. This is going to be one, uh, because this is, um, because this is uh, wave numbers. It's one over the wavelength. So very low numbers here corresponds to large features. And as you go up here, you're going to study smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller features. And then you can start to identify if something happened on that scale. And that's what people have done over decades. Um, so it turns out that there are a bunch of different conformations here. And the numbers you see here, what are those? They're rate constants, right? And that relates to the kinetics we spoke about earlier this week. So it's possible to use experiments. There is no way I can measure the actual transition. But by measuring how long it takes for these processes to happen, I can indirectly get the rate, well, rate constants or this, actually, one over this would be a rate constant. But this is characteristic times for how long it takes for each step to do. So based on this, can you say something about where the highest energy barrier is? 60 millisecond, right. So this is going to be a high energy barrier. That is a very low energy barrier. And I'm not this, we're not going to talk about bacteria rhodops in this entire lecture, but let's see if I can show you a small movie there. Yes. So first, 
Do you see that I get this isomerization? That pushes part of the structure very quickly to another state. You're going to get the slight twist of these entire two helices here, and then you're going to get the entire structure relaxing back again. And then it moves back in. And what has then happened is that because you were exposing or hiding these different residues here, this caused the proton to move over the protein too. So very small structural changes. Today you can sim so this is not a simulation actually, this is based on just interpolating between the structures. Uh, but today you can simulate these features. For G protein coupled receptors, people have done a ton of simulations to show what happens to proteins like this. So why would you be interested in a protein like this? Well, hey, archaea are mighty cool, but they might not, there's not a lot of healthcare that is focused on archaea for obvious reasons. So this type of receptor, could you imagine any other place where you have a protein that should convert light to a signal? The human eye. So you have proteins called opsins in your, on your retina. That small molecule is actually called the retinol. But I had told you that you would have guessed what it was, right? Um, and that's why, you have, that's why your retina is called retina. It's based on the name of that molecule. Uh, the cool thing with the opsins is that you have different opsins with slightly different sequences, and these sequences makes the opsins, uh, make these opsins sensitive to photons of different wavelengths. So they have observation maxima for different wavelengths, and that's how you get the sensation of different color in your eyes. And that's a great example of something a human does, but that would be very efficient for a bacterium or something. There is no way a bacterium needs a retina. It doesn't need to perceive the world. So an archaea is a much simpler organism and just uses this, again, Entirely similar type of protein, but just converts light directly to energy the bacterium needs. This is part of a much larger column. That's right. These are also very similar to a large class of proteins called G-protein coupled receptors, but I, I don't think I'm going to have time to talk about them today, so I'll talk about them next week. Uh, but they are super important pharmaceutically. This is part of a large concept that you're going to see again and again and again in membrane proteins. Something sitting in a membrane and transporting something from one side to the other. That is pretty much the main thing membrane proteins do. Not the only thing, there are lots of other things, but it's by far the most common membrane proteins, I think. There are a ton of different ones. We'll go through some of these. Um, so my first question is, why do we need these special proteins or something to transport things? So here I've written ions, but this could equally well be water. There are proteins transporting water too. Why would you need a protein to transport water? Right, but what's the big deal? Can't we have our water on the outside and some water on the inside and be happy with it? Like make up your mind for God's sake. If you have a certain amount of water on the inside, let that stay on the inside and let the water on the outside stay on the outside. In the case of a neuron, you need to transmit a current. So then you need well, you don't need so much water for that, but for instance, what happens with osmotic effects, right? If you change the salt concentration or the temperature or something, at some point, the pressure on the inside of this cell will start to, might start to build up. If you can't release some water then, you're going to explode. And that's kind of bad, I've heard. Uh, so at that point, the cell somehow needs to find a way to let water out, and later on you need to be able to let water in. That type of... Uh, so there are, there are even mechanosensitive channels that sense how much the membrane is pulling and potentially open up and let things through. There is a wide class of water channels called aquaporins that Peter Agu got the Nobel Prize for in 1997, if I recall correctly. No, not 1997, 1998 or so, I think. I should know. I don't remember anymore. Um, no, 2001. 2001. <laughs> so what do you need to do with an ion channel? And what, what, do, what do these proteins really do apart from opening up a hole? Well, so remember what I said, what happens if you put it, an ion in the middle of a hydrocarbon environment? It's so expensive that it won't happen. So Andrew Parsegian showed in 1968, and that actually is a year that I'm sure about, that what all these channels do, and this is mighty cool because this was like decades before anybody found out anything about the structures. What he argued is that to stabilize an ion going through a membrane, which is hydrophobic, you will need to shield the electrostatic. And you will need to shield the electrostatics so that you get the epsilon here up to at least, well, 20 or 40 or 20 or so, 
So that relative to the electrostatic here, that might be two or so, very hydrocarbon environment. So what this protein literally has to do is going to be to shield the electrostatic environment and so that you can take these ions so that it doesn't have to interact with the lipids. And by then you can start to say something, what, 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 what type of residues are we going to need to have on the outside of an ion channel? Outside facing the membrane? Hydrophobic, right? Because otherwise, on the outside of this, if it's not hydrophobic, it's going to be just as costly to expose a polar residue to the lipids. Not on the outside. Oh, sorry. I, sorry, no, I, sorry, I didn't mean the surface, but literally facing the bilayer. And on the inside of this, so you call this a pore, what type of residues are we going to need to have here? Charged, or polar at least. If you compare this with globular proteins, what does this mean? What do we say about folding of globular proteins? It's the right, so membrane proteins should be the opposite of globular proteins when it comes to structure. That's a really good statement. The, it's wrong, but it's a really good statement. We'll come back to why it's wrong. I would have guessed so too. But then we have something else here too, a pump. Um, the reason why I have this plot is that this is a huge part of what your cells are doing all the time. Um, this is an engine and that's kind of a clutch. So the way your cells use a large part of their energy is for neuronal signals. All of you have a nervous system. That's not obvious. A bacterium doesn't, an archaea doesn't. So that, and that's because you are vertebrates, right? You have a spine and a brain. That's occasionally pretty useful, um, but there are some problems with it. They consume truckloads of energy. And you need lots of energy for it. That's why bacteria don't have it. It wastes too much energy. This energy is primarily stored in the form of ions, potassium ions and sodium ions. And these ion channels are so cool that they're super fast to react, that this ion channel only lets through potassium. This ion channel only lets through sodium. They pretty much never ever make mistakes. Way better than any computer or anything when it comes to accuracies. And because there are too many, there is an uh, excess concentration of potassium on the inside and sodium on the outside. The millisecond these channel opens, boom, it will instantly let ions through. There is only one small problem with that, and what is that? Yes, and what would happen when you had the same number of potassium on the inside and the outside? Absolutely nothing happens when you open it more. So these channels are very efficient, but something is going to need to transport the potassium so that you have excess potassium here and excess sodium there. But that's easy, right? We can just have another channel that achieves exactly that. Or how do you achieve that? There is a problem there. You're going to need to pay, right? Because you can't spontaneously transport potassium to, from a place where you have low concentration to a place where it's high concentration. It goes against the gradient. You can say that from a completely different. So why, why can't that happen? Because the energy barrier is too high. No, forget about energy barriers. Nothing to do with energy barriers. It has to do with an important concept we picked up early on in this course. This thing blob in the middle, what I'm saying that it does is that it takes, for instance, sodium from a place where you have low sodium concentration, or actually you can start assuming that we have the same sodium concentration on both sides, and then this phase would take sodium here to have more sodium on one side, and it would take potassium here so that you had more potassium on the other side. Sure, but that's how, the na that's how nature and everything does it. So what I, this has to do with entropy, right? So you're taking something that's relatively disordered, you have the same concentration on both sides, and creating a state that is more ordered. That's reducing the entropy. And if you're reducing the entropy, you would move to low, uh, sorry, you would move to higher free energy, right? So forget about everything we know about nature and how nature might do it. You can say that's physically impossible. That can never happen spontaneously you will have to, you, there has to be something else that pays that energy. And that other thing is exactly what you spoke about. This is a molecule called ATPases. Um, it's a wide class of uh, proteins. 
discovered primarily by Jens Christian Sko in Aarhus in Denmark and got the Nobel Prize for it. So what ATP ACES does, not entirely shocking that ATP ACES, surprisingly it uses ATP, uh, which is the way your body stores a lot part of its energy. So this molecule binds ions and ATP and then it undergoes some very complicated rearrangements. Let's see if I can... No, sorry, this is just a still movie. I'm just rotating it here, it's not going to move. And then it uses this ATP. When it, once it has bound this ATP, this will force the entire ion channel to move over to a slightly different conformation because when you're bound ATP, it is apparently more favorable for this channel to change its shape slightly. As this channel is changing its shape, this ATP is losing one phosphate, so it's moving over to ADP, that's how we pay the energy. And while doing so, it's also moving ions in opposite directions. So it's pumping ions against their gradient. So it, and then eventually you're releasing the ADP and this channel will be back to its initial state. How frequently do you think this happens in your body? How much, a, just for fun, to get it, how much ATP do you think you use per day? Oh, yes, like your body's weight. <laughs> There's like 30% or so of the energy turnover in your body is used on this system. And that's of course why bacteria has gotten rid of it, because it's, it's, it's a nice thing to have a brain and a nervous system, but you do pay. Uh, and of those 20 or 30%, roughly two thirds of it is spent on your neurons in your nervous system. We know quite a lot about all these states. There's particularly a group in Aarhus led by Paul Nissen that have determined, I'm not sure, it's more than a dozen channels. I should know exactly how many and we've collaborated with some of them. But the cool thing is that we have not just individual states, but we pretty much have all the stills of the entire movie. We know from every single state here, do you have two ions bound? Do you have three ions bound? How has it moved between the different conformations? And then it's a remarkable puzzle to identify all these things in the right order and show how it might be possible to move between them. And Magnus Andersson up in, uh, in our team has worked a lot with Paul on this, doing simulations too. And what you typically get is this. So this is a, an electron density from an X-ray structure. And I know you're smart, you, you instantly realize how this protein works, right? The reason we're showing that, that it's, it's hard, it's really hard. Even you, in principle, we know where all the atoms are here. But to get from where the atoms are to understand how a protein works, it's not trivial. So what you end up doing here is that you need to sit down and assign different helices and everything where they are sitting in this particular structure. And that's going to be the same for, say, cryo-EM. Then you can start to place side chains, how the side chains must be placed you will eventually be able to say what are potential binding sites for ions. In this case, you're actually lucky because it's a fairly high resolution structure, so we even see the ions in the structure, this green electron density. And then you have to start comparing different structures, see what happens with these cavities as we are moving this between different conformations. This is, a, this is just a short simulation from Magnus. Um, I don't know, we're not gonna see it undergo any state changes here, but there you see the three ions bound on the inside. And this is also an example of how you do work. Like 20 years ago, people have been per perfectly happy with the structure. But today, when a group determines the structure, you want to simulate it. You want to, the place where you think you might have had an ion, is the ion really stable there? Uh, is the energy, for instance, if you're forcing the ion out by pulling it, the energy you see, is that a reasonable energy? Can we predict that this is a reasonable transition to undergo? So in many cases, we use simulations not necessarily to predict things, but to understand that the model we had from an even coarser X-ray experiment seems to be right. And that's why I'm going to say it's so dangerous. We, you just see these with all the atoms in the PDB and think that's the structure, and it's, it of course is the structure. But you should be aware of that the experimental structure is that. This is the experimental result. Everything else is an interpretation. It's usually a good interpretation by some very smart scientists, but just as the way simulations have lots of shortcomings, what you really should do is, of course, take your simulation right, calculate the electron density from your simulation, and see if that agrees with this density. Saying that an atom has deviated by one angstrom could as well be an error how you place this from the experimental data here. 
so that's half of the process. Um, I'm going to get back to the uh, ion channels in a little bit, but uh, there is something I've cheated a little bit in here. How does this end up in the membrane? Oh, yes, there's going to be a membrane yeah. roughly here. It's, like, it's not like you can cut open a big hole in the membrane, push this in, because if you cut that hole open, the entire contents of your cell would escape. You're going to need to produce new proteins all the time, right? And if you did this every millisecond in your protein, every time you did this, you would equilibrate the distribution of ions and everything. Your cell would die once every millisecond. So we're going to need some complicated mechanism of inserting this. And for a very long time, we didn't know. There are a couple of different models here that are worth knowing about. One of them I haven't told you yet. Do you remember these floppy fluid models I showed you of the membrane? That is a model originally proposed by Singer and Nicholson. You don't need to remember those names. But this model is called the fluid mosaic model. And the idea is that you have a membrane that really consists of I individual lipids can move around. And an individual membrane protein even diffuse around inside the membrane, just like the diffusion lab you did. A human membrane protein under normal conditions will diffuse around, but in 2D instead of 1D. And the probabilities of two proteins interacting, colliding, something participating in reaction, you can actually calculate that based on their diffusion rates. There is a fairly large lab down on floor three in this building led by Yalmar Brismar. And they are using membrane proteins and ATPases, and then they're trying to mark these with fluorescent probes. When you mark these with fluorescent probes, you can see where they are. The only problem is that this protein might be 10 nanometers. And what is the light, the limit of resolution of light in a microscope? 300. Roughly the wavelength of light, right? So you can't really identify where they are. This is why this group is one of the largest in Sweden using these new type of super resolution microscopy that got the, the Nobel Prize two years ago. Um, so that you can actually identify in particular where ATPases are with a resolution that is in the ballpark of the size of the protein. So you can identify not just in what cell, but in exactly what part of the cell. We can mark these so you see when they open up. So you can actually, in live cells, see what is the relative activity of the ATPases, when do they open, where do they open, how do they open. And now we're not talking about computer simulations. This is real microscopy on a real live cell. And there are even techniques that can occasionally do this in a live animal, say a rat brain or something. This is still a biophysical technique, but what I'm trying to do is that we, we're, we're learning a whole, a whole lot of what we've uh, learned about the energy turnover and everything, of course, comes from experiments like that. Very simple biophysical, well, no, they're not simple biophysical experiments, very complicated biophysical experiments. But then we can also, also measure that how fast do these proteins diffuse in the membrane. And that's how we've learned that it's not really a rigid crystal. And that's why I want to emphasize this classical picture with all straight tails, it is so wrong. This is like a two-dimensional liquid. It's water, it's like water, but it's not water, of course, but it can only move in two dimensions. But inside the membrane, anything is free to diffuse. So that's the first model, the fluid mosaic model. The other model is a model proposed by Jean-Luc Popot and Don Engelmann. And that's called the two-stage insertion model, or the Popot-Engelmann model. And what they're arguing is that membrane protein insertion or folding happens in two stages. You have individual helices inserting in membranes. And this is a gross oversimplification. I'm not saying that they insert directly, but the idea is that each helix should insert independently of the other helices in the membrane protein. And then magic happens, and somehow these helices aggregate to form a protein. Now, for a real protein, there would, of course, be some sort of loop between the helices or something. Let's just ignore that for a second. But they're part of the same protein. Is this right? So could you imagine an experiment where you could test it? You could mark uh, one helix or one loop and then try and insert and see what happens to... So what experiments would you then do? So the, the one problem is, of course, is that if you start removing part of your protein, you might very well have destroyed the structure of your protein, right? 
So it might be this model might still work really well, it's just that you screwed up the structure. So remember, there was not a coincidence that I showed you Rodopsin. <laughs> so what they did is that they took one of these seven transmembrane helical proteins. And that is, of course, expressed by a gene. But instead of having this as one gene, let's cut this gene into two pieces. So you have one gene with three helices and one gene with four helices. And the cool thing, and then you knock out the original gene so that the, the single gene with seven proteins do not exist anymore. And this means that you now have one gene where you express three helices and another protein with four helices. And the cool thing is that they show that you still have activity in the cell. So somehow these two different parts, they diffuse and find each other in the membrane. You certainly lost like 50% of the activity because it's, and that's reasonable if you think of diffusion or something. You, there, there will be a limit that if they are free, they're not going to meet each other that frequently. But this is pretty much the first proof that, of this concept that we're first inserting and then aggregating proteins. I would argue that this might very well be a future Nobel Prize. Uh, it's starting to get a bit, a bit old and there is this thing that discoveries, when discoveries become too old, they're no really obvious. They become so obvious that they're part of the general truth and then it can be hard to argue that they're great discoveries. But uh, Don Engelman in particular has done an amazing amount of stuff for membrane proteins. And that's, I realized that we've been, I've been reasonably good in this course at predicting Nobel Prizes. Um, I've done lots of mispredictions too. <laughs> um, but another problem, if you have, this is the same protein, but does it insert, so you have two loops here and one loop there, or will you have two loops there and one loop there? What decides the order in which a protein is inserted? Well, Popo and Engelmann didn't really say right. In principle, could you imagine both? Well, that would be a bit bad. What if that ATPase was inserted both ways? So you would, have, you would now spend 70 kilos ATP per day, and on average, the molecules would just cancel the contributions, right? That would be somewhat bad. So we need, in general, it can't be random. We have to control the, nature has to control the way membrane proteins are inserted. Otherwise, you couldn't uphold any sort of difference between the two sides. So Gunnar von Heine in our department actually discovered this some decades ago, which was one of the first examples of bioinformatics. And they were just studying what is the occurrence of charge residues. And it turns out you actually have charge residues in membrane proteins. It's just that they don't occur here, but they certainly occur in the loops. And Gunnar noted something fairly fun, that there are more charges on the loops on the inside of the cell. Sorry, there are positive charges on the inside of the cell, while the charges on the outside are usually negative. So this is what you call the positive inside rule. Uh, how do you think you prove that? So it's very easy, right? Just do four small mutations. Swap that with that, that with that, that with that, and that with that. They're in the loops, so they should not affect the structure. And suddenly you can show that you get proteins that insert the opposite way. Very cool experiment. I would argue that this too could be a Nobel Prize in the future. The reason Gunnar won't get the Nobel Prize is that he's the chair of the Nobel Committee. So, uh, sorry, the, the, chem the secretary in the Chemistry Nobel Committee now again, and I, <laughs> which kind of disqualifies him. Uh, otherwise, I would have think that Engelmann and von Heine would have been a very good chemistry prize. The other, sorry, the other part though with this process was that at some point you're going to need to get these helices together. Um, and from one point of view, we still subscribe to this, the beautiful, simple picture that these proteins are so much easier than globular proteins. We still believe that one this far. This looks simple this far, right? Uh, we, don't know, we don't know exactly how they insert, but we do know that they insert. It's beautiful. Every single helix is vertical here. And now we're just going to need to find a way to pack them. The beautiful thing is that Don found that. So they found that there are some pro small proteins, in particular a protein called glycophorin A, that is a single helix, but they dimerize. And in this protein, they love to have glycine in the middle. Actually, not just glycine in the middle, but you have a glycine, and then you have one, two, three other residues, and then you have a glycine again. Do you see why this is so remarkably good? <laughs> 
it's not might not be obvious remember the pictures i showed you was it yes on wednesday when you showed the surfaces of the helices and i claimed that there are edges and valleys those edges and ridges correspond to the side chains right and that's kind of what limits how close you can push two proteins together to each other these glycine residues when they're spaced three apart it's not entirely easy to see two-dimensionally but this one is actually a bit out in uh, from the uh, screen here while these two glycines are the ones that are closest to each other. So you're now going to have two residues that are close in space and there really aren't any side chains there. If you have two helices like that, that's going to be like having two helices and both of them have a small depression on their surface because you don't have any side chain. Those two depressions are going to love to just bind together and then this will form a dimer in the membrane. And they showed this with lots of experiments. But you know what else, what else was, was cool? That what would happen if you start to insert, if you insert charged residues, they will never ever insert in the membrane. But what would happen if you started to say, put a an asparagine or something that's, well, something that's polar, but maybe not charged here. Or here. Maybe. What's gonna happen to insertion? It's less hydrophobic. So it's not gonna insert quite as well, right? You can actually show that it does insert a bit because it's not a free charge. It's just, it's bad, it's not astronomically bad. But what happens when these two are inserted and you now have two side chains that can form hydrogen bonds? But you just put them in a place where they can't form hydrogen bonds because there is no water. Then we need to find their bonds. So they can form hydrogen bonds with each other, right? There is no water. Remember the thing that I was told about hydrogen bonds, that it's mostly entropy and water because it's a matter where you have the partner. Here there is a difference between not having any hydrogen bond whatsoever versus having a hydrogen bond. So this becomes a gigantic driving force for dimerization. So it's a beautiful, so this, there's an entire uh, example of these motifs. It's called the GX3G motif. And then there are probably dozens of papers where people have tried different mutations inside these X's. When this was found, th I think I would argue that not the general consensus, but a lot of people, partly me included, thought that we had solved the membrane protein folding problem. So we found this is called a motif, and a motif is just really a small pattern in a, in a protein or something that expresses something important, a binding site or something. So this is good. This was the first motif we found, and the other, the other question is how many other motifs like this there are, and when we know enough of these motifs, we can actually start predicting membrane protein structure because we will know how they interact. So that's a good question. So, of course, things have evolved a bit. So how many motifs like this do you think we have nowadays? Yes, it's one. <laughs> this is a really good idea, but it didn't work. And of course, people have certain. And they're pretty much, this is like a freak of nature probably. There are no motifs like this. This is the only one. So this is the problem, is that membrane proteins are not like we thought they were. It's not, it's not simple. It's not at all simpler than globular proteins, I would argue. But in that case, so why, but why don't we see any complicated membrane proteins? All the membrane proteins I've showed you this far have been relatively simple, right? Well. Forget about the ATPase for, for now, because that was a later protein. How does it come that the membrane proteins that I showed you are so simple, the early ones? So the ones we have structures for? Yes. Do you see any correlation there? What is it easier to get a structure for? A complicated or a simple membrane protein? So the problem is, right, all the ones we got the early structures for were the simple and low-hanging ones, while the difficult ones we couldn't get any structures of. So the more we've learned, the more we realize how little we know. So this is really the problem, which is failure. But it's actually, this is a, I talk about this as failure, but I think this is a remarkable success of science. When I was your age, and significantly later than that, we thought we had solved this. Bacterial rhodopsin, 1990. That was the year I got my undergraduate degree. No, actually it was 91. Uh, no, 91 I started my undergraduate degree. Sorry, I'm not that old. Um, but I'm apparently a bit uh, <laughs> suffering from Alzheimer or something. Um, simple, beautiful protein, seven transmembrane helices. It fulfills every single rule I spoke about. And then in 1997, this is the reason why, why I kept saying 1997 was the year Peter Ager published Aquaporin. Uh, 
Do you see something here? Yes, but on the other hand, um, I've also said that there is no rule in biology without an exception. This is the exception, right? Because, well, it doesn't quite go through, but it's, this helix ends, and then there's a similar helix from the other side taking over. So how bad is that going to be? Not really, right? Because they can form peptide bonds. Those peptide bonds will form a peptide bond with that helix. It's just that it's going to be a different part of the sequence. But every single peptide group here can form a hydrogen bond with the next helix. So it's kind of reasonable to argue, ha, fun freak of nature, but that can probably still be stable. And the last few years, though, we started to see proteins like this. Do you see that the, this is a helix oriented horizontally in the membrane? Some really complicated binding side, disordered residues, things that go in and then turn out again. Uh, this is just an example. I've stopped updating this slide. There are dozens of proteins like this now. Membrane proteins are not simple. Sorry. It's just that it seemed like a good idea at the time. This is how we thought. In the 1990s, it was reasonable to think that membrane proteins looked that way because by 1990, every single membrane protein we knew of looked that way. Which is, of course, because we only knew one membrane protein. But 100% of those proteins looked that way. Do you see any beta sheet membrane proteins here? No. They do exist, but they're very rare. Um, and there is it's pretty much a small class of proteins in the uh, uh, outer membrane pore proteins. You can, if you take a beta sheet and curl it up and rotate it so you let the end of the beta sheet join the beginning of it, you can form a small barrel. We know even less about those because we only have a handful of examples. Um, so I might not even talk about them. But if we look about membrane proteins, most of you are taking the bioinformatics class. And if you look at the hydrophobicity, for instance, for all residues, most residues are hydrophobic. The exposed residues are hydrophobic and the buried residues are hydrophobic. So everything that goes into the central membrane part is hydrophobic, while things out in this head group can be slightly polar. There is a problem with that. I'll let you think about that. You can look at the secondary structure. And again, this is statistics over all known uh, mem I forgot whether this over all known membrane protein structures or sequences, but it doesn't really matter that. If you have to take a guess for a membrane protein that you don't know anything about, it's going to be alpha helical. There are some very few examples of strands, but you can pretty much forget about it. But there is a problem here. Last slide. You had a pretty good idea that I told you was wrong. What is the problem with this slide? So exposed here means exposed to the membrane surface. Buried means that, uh, sorry, that towards the lipids. And buried means that you're turning something to the inside of the membrane protein. Yeah. <laughs> membrane proteins are not the opposite of globular proteins. They're hydrophobic everywhere. And if you think a little bit about it, that kind of makes sense in this insertion model because if the, if the, if the helices insert one at a time, they're going to have to be stable in the membrane one at a time or they would not insert, right? So that you can't have a helix that's half hydrophilic. Once you had folded a membrane protein, that would be nice, but it's never going to insert. So this means that they're not the opposite. Uh, and in fact, that they're going to be way harder than globular proteins because globular proteins, you can at least predict if it's something large and charged, it's going to be on the surface. If it's something hydrophobic, it's going to be on the inside. Membrane proteins, all bets are off. And that's why it's not just easier. They're significantly harder than globular proteins, which is kind of fun because it does provide job security if you're working with membrane proteins, but it's not easy to predict their structure. Does the helix still have a dipole, though? I mean, if you're moving it sort of one by one. They do. Now, so each helix, of course, has a bipedal bit. But remember, the modern membrane proteins are not just plain, simple helices, right? That they can be almost over the place. There are some things you can do to identify structure in bioinformatics that if you look at the sequence variation, and information content here really means that uh, how much, uh, let, let's see. Did I screw that up? Is that in the wrong order? Well, I forget about the slide, uh, those, but the point is that residues that are exposed to the membrane here, they're 
kind of passive, they should be hydrophobic. And things that are related to packing between residues, they seem to be slightly more conserved. Uh, and what that means is that the things that are packing between two helices or something, that it appears that it matters slightly more what residue we put there. Because if you replace an alanine with a tryptophan, they're not, no longer going to be able to pack. While things that face the lipids, they should just be hydrophobic so that the lipids, uh, we're happy in the lipids. So there are some ways of being able to at least try and predict membrane proteins. But in contrast to globular proteins, membrane protein structure internally is almost entirely Lena jones packing. We need to pack the helices in some way. And these are much, much, much weaker forces than electrostatics. And that's what makes them really hard to predict. The only advantage is that we get some guidance that the helices really need to go from, usually need to go all the way from one side to another, but even that isn't always true. This might be a good place to take a break. After the break, I'm going to talk about how membrane protein folding happens in reality, because there is one big elephant in the room that I haven't talked about. How do the helices insert in the membrane in the first place? It's 10.25 now. Should we meet here at 10 to 11? All right. Welcome back. So that must have been the world's longest 20, 25 minute break. What happened is uh, that I had a slight problem with recording equipment after the break, probably because either the battery ran out or because I had to reconnect the computer. So normally I would just tell you to read the chapters in the book, but given that this particular lecture on membrane proteins is much more focused, well, A, on our research, B, on our colleagues' research, and C, on the slides, it might have been a little bit difficult for you to read this up entirely on your own. So rather than saying that those of you who couldn't be at the lecture, it's your own problem, uh, I decided to re-record the second part of the lecture at least. I might do this just so slightly faster than I normally do at the lectures. But uh, let's get started. So before the break, we spoke about sequence variation. And all the stuff we did up until this, I kind of cheated because I just said, assume that there is some sort of way that the membrane proteins can make it into the membrane. But I didn't really tell you how that happened in reality. So the short story is that it doesn't happen quite that easy in real life. Um, in real life, we have lots of other mechanisms, molecules, in particular the ribosome and the translocum. So what you see on this slide is that you have the messenger RNA string in green there which carries the genetic information into this gigantic molecule in blue, the ribosome. And what the ribosome does is that it connects amino acids with peptides bond to each other, just as we described in the very first lecture in the course. And then this ribosome is typically attached to a membrane. So this is not any membrane at all. This is a particular part of the cell called the endoplasmic reticulum that you're probably aware of, which is really the protein factory of the cell. So what the ribosome does is that it gradually pushes out this uh, new protein, the nascent chain or the polypeptide that it says here, through the exit tunnel in the ribosome. And then the ribosome in turn is connected to this translocon. And that translocon is really a channel, but it's not an ion channel, it's a protein channel. At the time when Steve White, I think, made this uh, illustration on the left, there, well, the, uh, the illustration is probably older than the 2005 paper, but uh, Eventually, we managed to get structures of these translocon by Berg et al. And that's what you see on the right. So the translocon is really, think of this like a small sort of barrel with two big arms around it. And what you see on the lower right, sorry, on the top right, is where you see the uh, translocon from the side. So this is sitting right on the membrane plane. And then on your lower right, you see the translocon right from the top. And in particular, you see a small green helix and a small blue helix right in the middle on the right there. So what happens is that these two, since these are not connected, the blue and the green helix, the translocon can really open up its arms and let something, in particular helix, out into the membrane. So what happens is that depending on what sequences you have in this chain, uh, they go through the translocon and if it's very hydrophilic, it will just... Well, it might stay here a bit, but it's not really going to go out into the membrane because that would be too costly. And eventually, this will be a globular protein that ends up on the inside of the cell. Remember, it's not the plasma membrane, but the ER membrane. But for some other sequence, we might have very hydrophobic residues. And these residues, they're going to stay here a bit because they don't want to continue 
because if we push them out in the cell, it would be very unfavorable. And then this translocon likely breeds a bit all the time so that it occasionally opens. For a hydrophilic residue, that wouldn't matter. It would be bad to go out. But the hydrophobic residues, they would happily now diffuse out into the membrane. And then this would be a membrane protein. Not too surprisingly, perhaps. So having said that, you probably all agree that membrane proteins contain hydrophobic residues, while globular proteins contain hydrophilic residues. And the translocon kind of helps us select which is which. But that's the model that we have to test this in practice too. And this has actually been done by a colleague of mine, Gunnar von Heine in our department, and one of his students a few years ago, Tara Hesse. And they came up with this smart experiment that if we really want to measure the extent to which a certain segment, say a helix, inserts in a membrane, we're going to need to find a way to compare how much is inserted versus how much is not inserted, i.e. pushed through the translocon, which is also called translocated. And if you look in the upper left on this slide, they took a small protein called leader peptidase, which is really just three small helices that were hydrophobic. But then they took in particular the third helix of the small protein and started changing that helix. That's the one in red. In addition to changing that helix, they also made sure that there were two glycosylation sites before and after the helix. And this is not a course on biochemistry, so I'm not going to go into details what this glycosylation does. But it essentially adds small sugar fragments on the uh, peptide. And by using these sugar fragments and fluorescence, we will get a signal when this is translocated. But, sorry, we will get a signal when this is up in the ER lumen, but when it is in the cytoplasm, the signal is cancelled. So what that means is that if the entire segment is translocated, we're going to get both the glycosylation 1 and the glycosylation 2 signals. But if it's inserted instead, we're only going to see one of these signals. So if you look on the lower left, that's exactly what they've done. There are a few different sequences there they've tested. And depending on what signals you see here, in this case on the gel, we can decide how much of this protein was inserted versus how much was not inserted, translocated. And based on what you know in the course before, you know how to use that measurement and turn that into a free energy, right? Because the second you know what is the probability of being state A versus what is the probability of being a state B, well, that's determined by a Boltzmann distribution, right? And when you take that Boltzmann distribution and really solve for the free energy instead of the probability, you got to get the result that the difference in free energy is minus RT ln and then the quotient between the probabilities. And so in chemistry, we would say RT, a physicist might say KT here, but that's just a matter of units. And that's what you see down there, right? It says an app for a parent. I'll get back to that in a second. Uh, but the cool thing is that the second you can measure two things in relation to each other, you can usually convert that to a free energy for going from one state to the other. And that is beautiful. Then you can create this nice, wonderful red plot you have on the right that for each amino acid which says how costly is it to insert this in a membrane. And somewhere there I would expect to hear some protests from some of you. Because what's the problem with this? Well, on the one hand it's beautiful, right? You have that we gain some energy, free energy from inserting the hydrophobic ones like isoleucine, leucine and phenylalanine. While the most expensive ones to insert are the charged ones, or EKD. But look at the Y scale. The Y scale ex appears to be extremely compressed. We, are, we only gain half a kcal per mole for inserting isoleucine, and we only pay like three, three and a half kcal per mole for inserting a for inserting a charge residue. Do you remember the first part of the lecture? Taking an ion and forcing that to be in a hydrocarbon cost how much? Well. These residues are really ions. They're amino acids, but they're charged, and therefore they're ions. And you can even take some of these side chains, say the arginine side chain, and uh, use that as an isolated molecule. And for arginine, that would be called a like guanidinium ion, which is what you see here. And the cost of inserting that in a hydrocarbon is roughly 17 kcal per mole. We know that from par simple partition coefficients. So there is something fundamentally wrong that it should cost 17, and in practice it costs roughly 3. There is something here we do not understand. So can you think of any solutions to that? 
Well, one of them could of course be that it's magic, we have a translocon. Well, not necessarily magic, right? But it's obvious that if you have a biological molecule that can drive this process, it's going to be completely different than from just inserting it directly, right? Or... So what did we say about free energies last week, or a couple of days ago at least? Well, the free energy is a state property. So the free energy of being in a particular state only depends on that state. It can't depend on the way you took there. So if you're there, the free energy from going from A to C, that depends on the free energy in A and the free energy in C. It cannot depend on what happens in B. It can't be cheaper for go to go A, B, C than just to go A, C, if it's under equilibrium. If that was not been the case, we end up in the argument I had a few days ago about perpetuum mobilis, right? Because if it was cheaper to go one way, you could pay the cheap way and gain the energy back the way where the difference was much larger and then you would just keep gaining energy. So that doesn't work. In principle, you could argue that the A state here versus the translocated state uh, at the bottom where I don't have any letter are slightly different, but in practice they're not. They're virtually identical in ion concentrations and everything. So you could of course still imagine that the body does something amazing in uh, B, but no matter how amazing that is, if we believe that there is equilibrium between A and C, it doesn't matter what happens in B. B might speed up the process, this might be a catalyst, it might certainly be good for kinetics, but it cannot change the equilibrium distribution. So there is a famous quote from an old episode of Simpsons that I like to use here, that young lady, in this household we obey the laws of thermodynamics. I think it's saying it's the daughter. And that's the beautiful thing with thermodynamics. It doesn't matter what type of magic happens in B, that cannot change the equilibrium distribution between A and C. So are there any other things um, we can think of? Well, both we and others have looked at this with simulations over the last 5-10 years, and I would say that there are two potential explanations. Um, the first one is that I've reminded you about a couple of times is that a membrane is not a lipid bilayer. And what we're showing here is really a protein sitting right in the middle of a lipid bilayer, right? But remember that membranes contain in the ballpark of 30% proteins and those proteins, while they are not super hydrophilic, they are certainly not as hydrophobic as a pure hydrocarbon that you would have in C. So if we now imagine that you had lots of protein or something in C, a real membrane might actually not be as hydrophobic as a lipid bilayer. And that's actually confirmed if you look at MD simulations that we, are, we had, a, had a really talented student, Anna Johansson, who did this a few years ago. So that can kind of explain that it's somewhat cheaper to insert a charge residue like arginine or lysine in particular in a membrane than in pure hydrocarbon, because a membrane simply isn't a pure hydrocarbon. But can we think of that some other ways? Well, when it comes to arginine, you could also imagine having the arginine helix in the middle of the layer, but then because there are so many charges, the arginine is not stable there, so what the arginine would do in practice is somehow slide halfway out or something so that these residues could snorkel or interact with the charged head groups. If you only have one arginine residue, you could certainly imagine that's the case. The only problem is that if you repeat this experiment, but then you use two arginines and place them symmetrically and just slide them further and further out. Well, the problem is you can't slide to both directions at the same time, right? So in that case, we would ex expect those type of sequences to be extremely costly and they aren't really that costly. So when it comes to arginine though, um, the simulations I just told you about that pretty much explains it within a factor two or so. On the other hand, leucine? Leucine most certainly won't slide halfway out. But what's the problem with leucine? Well, remember that our scale I showed you, it's not just a matter that we're not paying as much as we should, the entire scale appears to be compressed. So the leucine residue itself appears to not, we don't gain as much from inserting leucine as we would expect. This too can probably explain, be explained by the fact that membranes are not quite as hydrophobic as we would expect, so that the scale the difference compared to water is simply not quite as large as we would have expected. 
The problem though is that when we and others have done simulations of this, we don't really see much of that effect for leucine. So leucine, we haven't really been able to explain. I think that we, have, we can with a bit of hand waving, but it, I'm a bit more uncertain when it comes to leucine than arginine. But the other thing is what we say at the bottom of the slide here, that there is actually, had you asked me 10 years ago, whether membranes are stable, membrane proteins are thermodynamically stable in a membrane, I would have said, of course. But if you think biologically, that's not absolutely necessary. It's enough, membrane proteins need to be stable in a membrane, but they only need to be stable for biologically relevant times, say months or something until the protein is uh, degraded by the body. So what you might imagine is that some proteins might actually not be happy in a membrane. So why do they stay in that case? Well, if you look at these helices, the second you start to slide them out, you would need to drag either the N or the C terminus of the helix through the most hydrocarbon part of the body, right? You would expose three peptide bonds, and it's actually worse than the peptide bonds because you also have these effective helix dipoles. So it will be extremely expensive for this helix to slide out. Second, from the body's point of view and the cell, it would be bad if membrane, it really helps that membrane proteins are really nice and stable. They don't really move up and down. If membrane protein helices were diffusing a bit randomly up and down, I think it would be very hard to have stable membrane proteins. So what might be the case is that the translocon uses, well, the ribosome uses energy to push things in the translocon, and the translocon then helps us to insert things so that we get the particular helix inside these head groups that we have on each side. And once it's here, even though it might not be super happy there, it would be a very high energy barrier for the helix just to slide out directly. And that might very well be the case. So I'm big caveat emptors here. This is certainly not something that has been proven uh, experimentally, but it might, it just might be possible that membrane proteins, at least some of them, might only be kinetically stable in membranes rather than thermodynamically stable. And that relates very much back to what we've talked before in earlier lectures about valleys for thermodynamic stability and barriers for kinetic stability in the free energy landscape. So having said that, you probably know this quiz by now. Um, if I show you two small helices here, one on the right, that's polyalanine, and one on the left that contains lots of arginine, and to make life a little easier, I can even add lots of charges on the one on the left. I've occasionally run this quiz without doing the further two or three slides prior to this one. And it's surprisingly how many even senior professors don't realize how important the one on the left is. Because it turns out that the helix on the left is not just a one that occurs in a membrane protein, but it's possibly one of the most membrane protein helices we have. So this is a segment in a voltage-gated ion channel. If you look at the protein here, you see a big central pore. And right in the middle of the pore, you have the small channel that lets through an ion. And on the outside, you have four small domains in the corners that are these so-called voltage sensor domains. And they contain some four helices, and the fourth helix in each of these domains contains these arginines. So why do we have an arginine helix there? Well, these proteins are super important for, say, conducting uh, nerve signals in nerve cells. They're important for your heartbeats, uh, converting those signals into muscle activity. They're important when a sperm fertilizes an egg to close the egg. It's a super important part of your nervous system. And these are really the proteins that consume all those ions that the sodium potassium ATPase was pumping. And if you think a little bit about it, if you want something to change function or change form, shape, conformation, when you change the voltage. Well, having a charge is the obvious way to do that. If you have a charge and there's a voltage change or voltage difference, there's going to be a force on the charge. And that force is ultimately what's going to move this helix up and down in this protein. And that's the reason why we get these nerve signals. So a nerve signal, this so-called action potential, which you can also see in an EKG, that is really just a chain reaction of these voltage-gated channels. One channel leading to the opening of the next, leading to opening of the next, leading to opening of the next. In reality, it's slightly more complex because we also have sodium channels, but I'm, I'm going to leave that out for the topic of this lecture. So the way these voltage sensors work, if you look on the uh, structure to the left, there is a blue helix in the rear. That's the one with the arginines. 
And what happens is that somehow this helix is going to need to move up or down. So it actually turns out that in the very first structures people got, Rob McKinnon in particular, they saw this helix together with the helix before it, um, lying like a small paddle right in the interface between the membrane and the water. So this was simply an artifact of the crystallization conditions that the, while this was happy in the membrane, for whatever reason, the, uh, the micelles or the detergents that were used to, uh, to overexpress the protein, the protein wasn't stable in that conformation. Now, to Rod's credit, he was, I think, the first group to realize that this must be wrong too. And a few years later, they published the correct structure, which is the one you see here. But it's not entirely easy, right? Because if the blue helix is going to move up and down, you're going to have at least four arginines there that are exposed to the membrane. And that can't happen. We just said that's eat my left shoe territory. So the way this happens is that first, they don't exist in isolation. As you see in the figure in the middle, the lower middle, there is also this central pore domain. And this central pore domain is really going to be the neighbor of most of these arginines. So they're, at least the one in the middle, they rather face another helix than the lipids. Not quite as good as water, but certainly not as bad as a pure hydrocarbon. The other part is that a lipid bilayer is not, not just oil. You remember, the, you remember what the lipids look like? You had these carbonyl groups, you have the phosphate groups, there are lots of negative charges in each lipid. So what likely happens is that in particular the upper of these arginines, which is also the one facing most outward, it's not really located in the hydrophobic center of the membrane, but it's located so far up that it will rather form salt bridges, that is an electrostatic interaction between a positively charged ion and a negatively charged ion in the lipid. And Rod actually showed that's the case, because if you put this protein in a different type of lipid environment, one that lacks negative charges in the head groups, it doesn't work. So that's pretty cool. The other thing that you can think of here, if you look on the right hand side of this, you see that there is almost a spiral stair shape of these arginines. If you're now going to take this helix and somehow change it, this is going to need to both move up and it's going to need to rotate to maintain the same interactions between the different arginines. That's an extremely complicated conformational transition. Anything can happen in practice, but if I would have to guess, that would likely take a minute or so. Can you think of something else that you could do with this helix? Do you remember that very early on in the course, I brought up these different types of helices? And then I said that there might be some special locations when you need one type of helix instead of the other. Well, in hindsight, like I said, that was not purely for academic reasons. The reason why I brought up in particular those 310 helices is that just now and then they do occur in nature. And this is one of those cases. So if you remember the 310 helix, compared to an alpha helix, an alpha helix had 3.6 residues per turn. And that is, if you have these residues and you have three neighbors between them all the time, they're not, they're going to end up being slightly shifted for each turn. And that's why you get the spirals there. But a 310 helix had exactly three residues per turn. So if you now take this helix and then wind it slightly tighter, you're suddenly going to have all these charged residues line up exactly over each other. That would likely lead to a helix that can move straight up or straight down much quicker. We have seen that in simulations. There are some other groups that have seen that in simulations too. But the problem is, of course, here we're looking at an experimental structure where we don't see it. Well, actually, you do see it in the very lowest part of the helix, but not in the upper part. And I think this is a bit of an open question. It could certainly be that this has been overexpressed in a crystal, relaxed for weeks. It might very well be that the helix relaxes. Or what we have come to think, I believe more, is that you might actually have a small part of sliding 310 helix so that the very short part in the center when all these residues need to jump from one partner to another, if that part is 310 helical, that's actually going to be sufficient. And then you can let the helix relax and be alpha helical above and below that because it's slightly better in terms of free energy for a helix to be alpha helical than 310. But the beautiful part is how much we can learn from the combination of X-ray structures, functional studies, in particular mutating these residues, and models and simulations. It actually turns out that since this voltage sensor has two states, it's going to be in the down state, relaxed state, when you have a potential across the membrane, 
and it's going to be in the open state when you have, well, when you remove the potential, when you've depolarized it. So what state do you think it's going to have in an X-ray structure? Such as the one you're seeing. Well, you can't really apply a membrane potential in an X-ray structure, partly because, well, partly for technical reasons, but more important than that, you typically don't have a membrane around your protein anymore, but you have some sort of detergent. And of course, if you now grow this for, this would relax in a less, much faster than a millisecond, but if you now grow this for weeks in a crystal, it's going to be in an extremely depolarized conformation and fully open. And that's a bit of a bummer because we could probably learn a lot from the transitions if we also knew the down state. The beautiful thing is that there have been a number of groups, including us, that have been able to simulate this. And we actually know what the down state is here, but that's primarily based on simulation data. Had this been one simulation, you could doubt it. Two, well, that's a nice confirmation, but it's still a bit uncertain. But by the time you have five or 10 independent simulations and they all end up with the states that are roughly identical, this is now so good that I would argue even, even experimentalists have come to accept the computational models of these down states. And I think that's a gigantic shift in how we see structural biology. So computational studies are no longer a post-experiment analysis technique, but it's really something that we can use for at least determining specific states in addition to trying to crystallize them. I'm going to show you one of the coolest such simulations. Um, this, remember the simulations I showed you earlier this week? They had time scales in the ballpark of 50 or 100 nanoseconds. Have a look at the counter where it says 0.0, .0 mu s. Those, that is a microsecond counter, so a thousand times longer time scales than in the nanoseconds. What you're seeing here is the protein, and these blue parts is really going to be the part where we have the gate and where we close the channel. Right now it's open. The green parts are the voltage sensors, and the red helix there, that's this S4 segment that's going to be moving. So let's go. That's 10 microseconds already. 20, 30, 40. You're gradually going to see that the, select that the pore, the gate in the central actually closes. Do you see there? that it's virtually impossible for an ion to get through. This appears to be a very asymmetric state, but that's the way physics work. Uh, we don't have to force a, a symmetry. You can still be symmetric on average. We're now at 200 microseconds. It's an insanely long simulation, and these are now timescales where we could actually do electrophysiology experiments and everything and see it very easily. And you will probably also see, well, now we looped, but before we looped, you probably also saw that the voltage sensors are moving quite a lot. So this protein is not quite that rigid. Let's have a look from the side instead. Uh, one, two, three, we go. So I think here we're gonna get to 215 microseconds or so, and then it's gonna slow down. And when it slows down, you're gonna see this helix here. Do you see that it moves down? The blue arginine is there. They move one step down at the time. And I think we're gonna get one more step there, yes. And then I think we're gonna speed up again in a second. So now we have this entire red helix that moved vertically down. And I think now we're going in the other direction here instead. These simulations are not possible to do in a normal computer. But what you see up on the left is a special purpose-built machine called Anton, designed by David Shaw, who used to be a professor of computer science, but uh, has spent a lot of years working in the financial industry and stock market. And the reason why it's possible to do these things with a dedicated uh, computer, it's kind of the same reason that if you try to save an image, if you try to save a JPEG image in Photoshop on a computer, that might take 0 0.1 seconds. So you could save 10, sec 10 images per second. But on the other hand, you could also save images on your iPhone. And your iPhone can probably save like 100 still images per second. So that's kind of strange. How does it come that a phone that just draws one or two watts can be more powerful than a computer? Well, the reason for that is that a computer in general is programmable, while an iPhone has a special part of its chip designed specifically to just do image compression. And that's why all these digital cameras are so good at it. Now, that works well if you had chips that you're going to sell a billion copies of. There are lots of people who want a camera with JPEG compression. But these computers, when you only might sell 10 or 100 of them or something, that becomes exceptionally expensive because this is literally building a new microprocessor that cannot run a program, but it can only run a molecular dynamic simulation. But again, this is another one of these 
gigantic shifts in it because suddenly it's possible to see in almost on the fly processes as they're happening on time scales that are at least a thousand if not ten thousand times longer than what we've been used to before. However, as beautiful as that is, there is a problem with that. Can, can you remember what that problem is based on what I said about simulations earlier in the week? What is a simulation? Well, the one thing I told you that a simulation is not right, it's a simulation exactly of how a particle or a collection of particle moves. And the reason for that is that we don't know the initial conditions exactly, and the second we don't know the initial conditions exactly, they're going to deviate exponentially. So a simulation is just a matter of sampling from a Boltzmann distribution. So even in this particular case, David Shaw and his team, they were ran a bunch of different simulations, I think it was five or so of them, to show that this was statistically reproducible, and they got it several times. The challenge here is that many... This type of simulation suddenly makes experimentalists love simulations. There are so many things you can simulate. But I think it's very important that you and others need to be the same voice there and say, well, as beautiful as that simulation is, what we need to think about is how accurate the statistical sampling is. And can we really use this to predict which state is the more stable one, rather than believing that this is a microscope? It is conceptually a microscope in the sense that it can help you understand things but it is not a microscope in the way that it's showing you exactly how atoms move. So again, caveat emptor, and you're the person who's responsible for being the same voice in these cases. All right, that was the voltage-gated channel part. As I told you, voltage-gated channels are important in nerve signaling, and that's what you see up here um, from the top left, a nerve impulse is coming in a nerve cell. But nerve cells are not infinitely long, and at some point one nerve cell has to convey the signal to another nerve cell, or, well, you might need to change the signal, or you might need two nerve cells combine a signal. There are lots of reasons why your body needs to have nerve cells talking to each other. The way the body does this is that when you get the signal at the end of the first cell, you release small bubbles with chemical molecules, neurotransmitters, but these neurotransmitters are actually frequently just small amino acids, single amino acid molecules, like glycine or glutamate. And then they diffuse over this very thin synactive cleft here, ballpark of 0.1 millimeter or so. And then the green molecules, the neurotransmitters, will bind to the pink molecules here, which are ion channels. But these are not ion channels that are controlled by voltage but ion channels that are controlled by the binding of a small ligand, or that is ligand-gated ion channels. There is a huge variety of these channels, and it's really these channels, when they open, and now they're going to let through a specific ion, say a chloride ion, this is now going to lead to a reduced potential on the inside of the next cell, and in that case, that's going to lead to a new electrical nerve signal in that cell. And then we have transmitted it across the synapse or the synaptic cleft that you see there in the middle. These channels are mighty cool, um, and I'm biased here too because we worked on these channels too for a long time. They, the neurotransmitter can be a large number of small things like gamma aminobutyric acid, glycine, acetylcholine, serine. So they can bind not quite anything but a very large number of different drugs. And then they can conduct either anions or cations. So depending on exactly what channel this is, and the difference between these channels can be as little as two or three residues. They can either hyperpolarize or depolarize the membrane, which means they can either inhibit or create a nerve impulse. Complicated, we'll get back to that. There is something else that it says here, anesthetics and ethanol. Um, I'm going to jump to another slide, and then we'll talk more about that. This is a real photo taken at Massachusetts General Hospital, right next to Harvard University, in a room called the Morton Auditorium. You can actually still visit. It's a pretty cool place. And this was October 16, 1846. This patient is Edward Abbott, and I think he's having a tumor on his neck removed or something. And this was the second example in the world where people were able to sedate a patient, perform surgery on them, and the patient actually lived. 
Now, we, we might have used other types of self-sedative uh, or anesthetics such as ethanol or something before, but the key thing here, this was really controlled. He was in no pain and he survived. The first patient actually survived too. That was a few days earlier that somebody had a tooth extraction, but for whatever reason, I haven't found any photos of that. How does anesthetics work? Well, the scary thing is that anesthesia has a history of 150, more than 150 years, and it's mostly trial and error. Very good trial, mind you, but still trial and error. So there is a famous result in anesthetics called the Meyer-Overton hypothesis or the Meyer-Overton correlation for anesthetics. So what you see in this plot is that on the x-axis you have the olive oil to gas partition coefficient at body temperature. So on the left you're not very soluble in oil and on the right you much prefer oil to water. And on the y-axis the lower down you are on the y-axis the better this molecule acts as an anesthetic. MAC or minimum alveolar concentration to get an anesthetic effect. If you look at this, it's kind of amazing how perfect this correlation, right? So that it appears anesthetic effect is purely based on hydrophobicity of the molecule. So in that case, what would you imagine that an anesthetic, how an anesthetic acts in your body? Well, I would guess that you're going to predict that it goes into the membrane and you are in exceptionally good company there, right? Jesus, if it's this, if it's entirely correlated with how hydrophobic it is, this must be that the molecules dissolves in the membrane, and then they must they must do something strange to the membrane. Um, things molecules like xenon there in the middle is this, xenon is never going to bind to anything, so it must somehow be altering the membrane properties. Now, that's a very good idea, um, but today we have a huge number of different inhalation anesthetics. Um, if you go out and have surgery today here at Karolinska, they're likely going to administer civofluorane or desfluorane that you have there on the right. They're not going to give you ether as they did in 1846. But the funny thing is that these channels that we have, sorry, this is a picture from the top of the channel. I'll get back to that in a second. We have actually found specific residues in the sequence of the ligand gated ion channels. And if you mutate away that residue and change this to something else, you can actually show that rats are suddenly not susceptible. You can't sedate them to some of the anesthetics I showed you on the previous slide. And that's strange. That's quite a paradox, right? So on the one hand, we know that anesthetics are purely hydrophobic. This should be a pure hydrophobicity effect that they go into the membrane. But on the other, there might be, if there is a specific residue, there almost has to be a specific binding site in these channels for anesthetics. And people have thought about this for decades, well, two decades at least, including me. What I show in this slide is a fairly remarkable thing, that in the early 2000s, Nigel Unwin finally was able to determine a structure of one of the channels, the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, which is super important in humans too. This was based on cryo-electron microscopy. Um, Again, 15 years ago, the, the, sand, the detectors were not uh, as good as they are today. But when you have a couple of thousand images like this one, we were able to build a model, not just of the transmembrane domain, but also the entire extracellular domain. And I so remember then this came because both we and a number of other groups, we were ecstatic that this really confirmed our predictions that it should be a pentamere and inside each monomer, we should have four helices in the transmembrane domain and which should predominantly have beta sheets in the extracellular domain. This was beautiful. Now, the caveat is that what you're going to see in the PDB is, of course, not an image like that, but rather something like this. Well, the hydrogens is added in the molecular model here. And as good and beautiful as that experiment is, you probably realize, too, that we don't quite have the detail here, that, but there's been quite a bit of modeling involved. And in particular, one of the hardest parts of the modeling is to decide exactly how do we align the sequence that is each amino acid to the structure, the rough shape that you see in the blue cryogenic image here. If you start making just one minor error, so if you place amino acids one unit off in a helix, that's going to be an RMSD of roughly three angstrom. So you make a very large error the second you place one residue wrong. What's worse is that some of these residues, serine-267 in particular, that we had found that were extremely important for anesthetic activity. 
Well, depending exactly how you make that alignment, they're going to be located either inside each subunit, such as the red one here, or between, say, the red and the orange subunit. So we have no idea where those binding sites were. Oh, sorry, I'm going to spend a little bit more time on that. Um, I might talk more about that later in the course, but I think it's an example that simulations has helped quite a bit here too. What we have done since then that I don't have any slides on is that we've been able to use simulations to prove the existence of both these binding sites. And then you can go back and take the models that you have in the simulations, predict what residues you should knock out to get a specific effect. And then you can test that. And you can test that with a technique called electrophysiology that I will get back to a little bit later on in the course. But we kind of, we kind of like talking about our own research, so that's worth its own lecture. There is one more class of proteins that I'm going to bring up if it course, and that's called tyrosine kinase receptors, or RTKs, receptor of tyrosine kinases. Most of the membrane proteins I showed you here, they were large ones in the sense that they had a very large transmembrane domain. But there are also examples of receptors where you have a fairly big blob outside the cell. You just have a single helix that anchors it in the membrane, and then you have some other domain on the inside. And that's the case for this type of receptors. What then happens is that in a normally working cell, you would get a ligand, a chemical molecule or something that binds to these extracellular domains. When this molecule binds, this induces dimerization because it brings the two parts together. And then these two green helices are going to stable each other exactly in these forms that I showed you before the break, right? And when these are then held together, some sort of signal will be released on the inside that, for instance, leads to cell growth differentiation or something. Now, in a normally working cell, the ligand eventually leaves, and when the ligand leaves, since they were just borderline stable together, these helices will eventually diffuse away from each other again, and when they diffuse away from each other again, they no longer signal, which is good, because otherwise bad things would happen. Now, unfortunately, in some cases, there might be mutations in the helical sequ sequences. So remember that I said that it's possible to insert other residues that might affect how much two helices attract each other. And that happens in some cases for these. So the blue helices here, they have a mutation that causes them to bind much stronger together. The sad thing is that they bind so much stronger together that even when this ligand and the extracellular domain leaves, they stay bound together. And when they stay bound together, they keep signaling on the inside for the cell to divide and grow. And the cell is going to go completely berserk, and that's what leads to tumor growth. But in principle, we're not talking about a gigantic protein now. We're talking about a single helix interacting with another single helix. So what if you could design a locking key? So the red helix here would be some super smart designed helix that the red helix would bind even stronger to a blue helix then the blue helix would bind to another blue helix. So each blue helix would much rather be paired with a red helix than pairing up blue-blue. Now, if we could do this, this would likely break all those bad blue-blue interactions. And in that case, we would stop the cell growth. So there have been a number of groups attacking this problem. In particular, Bill de Grotto, almost a decade ago, together with Joanna Slusky, who worked at DBV for a couple of years, actually. So what they did is that they realized this, this problem is so simple. This is just a matter of two helices crossing. Remember that I said that in principle there are only two potential angles. Helices will cross each other with roughly plus 20 or minus 50 degrees based on the packing of the ridges and valleys in each helix. Well, just two confirmations might be a little little, but let's bring up every single helical crossing we have in the literature or at least in the protein data bank. And then we can look what sequences you typically have in those crossings. So if we now, in the A part of this figure here, if we have a particular helix that we would like to stabilize, the one in the front, what residues should we build in the helix, in the red helix, in the back? So now it's, we don't have that much freedom. You only have 20 amino acids to place. We have to make sure that the helix stay a helix. You can't pick any amino acids you want. So this is just going to be a matter of finding amino acids that stabilize these two helices at a pair. 
Now, that is an expensive computational problem, but it's a tractable computational problem compared to folding an entire protein. So what Joanna and Bill and co-workers did is that really they created, they wrote computer programs to do this. And the nickname for this was CHAMPS, Computed Helical Anti-Membrane Proteins. So the idea is that you just select backbone geometry you want, you find the helices in proteins to use as a template, and then you design this complementarity so that these two helices, one of the helices we can't change because that's going to be the bad blue helix we have in nature, but we can swap almost every single residue in the other helix to make sure that this is a helix that binds to the first helix. And this actually works. So the, you could of course argue, well, how are you sure that this method is going to produce good results and everything? Well, the way you show this is that you can show in experiment that these helices actually have affinity to each other, that they do bind each other. This is a few years ago. The reason why you haven't seen a lot of results like this on the market is not that they are rare. I would argue that there are hundreds if not thousands of studies that are now able to very specifically design completely new folds, proteins targeting, well, small artificial proteins targeting other proteins. But the way pharmaceutical production works is that from the time you discover something until you start going through clinical tests and eventually put it on the market is frequently going to be at least 10 years and frequently 15 years. So I think if you wait another decade or so, I expect we're going to see much, much more of this type of designer drugs. And that is related to what I told you last lecture. Do you remember that I talked about biologicals? This is a biological too. It's a simple biological. It's just a single helix rather than a complete antibody. But it follows the same principles. We design something with amino acids to get a specific shape, get specific interactions, and hopefully these interactions are going to be so specific that it works better than the traditional small drug. Now, if this works, it's going to be much more potent because there, it's more specific. Um, it is also, the specificity also means that there are much fewer side effects, at least when things work. I'll get back to that. The disadvantage is that it's a protein, so if you were to eat the pill with this, it would be degraded in your stomach by the enzymes. So you would need to re inject, keep injecting this, which is bad, um, both because of quality of life and because companies are, well, say what you want about it, but companies are in business to make money. And the companies realize the patient has to inject something, they are likely going to prefer some other drug that they don't have to inject, even if the quality might not be quite as high. It can also be very expensive to synthesize these drugs um, because you, well, it's not longer a matter of simple chemistry production, but you know how to overexpress and purify these proteins, for instance, from bacteria. The other reason that can make this expensive to synthesize is that one way to get away from these injection criterion is to use, for instance, artificial amino acids or something that makes sure that these proteins are not degraded. But just as we don't have artificial amino acids, bacteria normally don't have them either. So then it becomes an even more complicated production process. And then, well, whether this is uh, an advantage or not, they clear fast from the body, which means that you keep needing to take new injections of them. Normally this works really well, but as I told you earlier on in the course during a break, um, there are some examples where really bad things have happened. And one of this was a few years ago when the German company called Tegenero, they were developing a, an antibody really, which is called TGN1412 was their internal name. This worked by activating a special receptor called CD28. Um, I'm not going to go into details of T cells. You've taken a course on that before. But the whole idea is if we can, act, we can use this to activate and then try to kickstart the normal immune defense. Rather than doing all ourselves, we basically kickstart the body's own defense and then we have the body do the actual work for us. Really neat idea in theory. And it worked beautifully in all the computational tests, it worked beautifully in all the simple chemical tests. And then when you got to phase one, when you start studying this, uh, testing this on patients, there was a disaster, complete disaster. Uh, so I think there were seven young people that said they had to amputate fingers, their heads swell up, swell up and uh, I even think that one of them developed cancer. So the question is, what happened? Well, most of this is not public yet, so I've only, this is partly based, based on educated guesses from me and others what might have happened. 
Um, so take this with a fairly large grain of salt, like half a kilo of salt. But what might have happened is that this is really a super agonistic antibody. Um, so we want to use this to kickstart your immune defense in a way that's stronger than what the immune defense would do by itself. Now, obviously, um, the reason why we're designing this is that we want to administer this in humans eventually. Mice don't really have a whole lot of money to pay for drugs, so that is much better to target humans. And that, of course, to use that in testing and everything, we need the human and mouse to share most of the protein structure, function, and sequence. And they kind of do that. It's 93%. It's not awesome, but it's probably okay to start designing things. The only problem is that in the extracellular part of the CD28 protein, there's only two-thirds identity. And then you're starting to get into the territory where it's really dangerous. So there might be some substantial difference, not necessarily in structure, but in specific function and interactions. So what might happen there is that if you now go through all these tests and we do the animal tests in rats and everything, and then you measure what dose you need in a rat. Well, what if you now get the rose and realize you want dose X here, and then you take dose X and give that to a human. The problem is that that molecule that kind of didn't work that well in a rat, that we needed quite a lot of it, suddenly when we administer this in a human, it fits. Like, it's not that it just fits, it fits perfectly. It starts kicking in on every single cylinder, and it's not just super, but hyper activates your entire immune defense. Your immune defense and your entire body will go crazy. Mind you, that's speculation. So why are people that stupid? Wouldn't they have understood this? Well, it turns out we did. Um, there are lots of procedures. Like when it comes to clinical tests, this is not something like a professor decides on a Tuesday afternoon that, hmm, it would be fun to get some drugs tested tomorrow. I'll see if I ever have any volunteer students. But you, well, you license, you uh, hire a company and they started following all the specific procedures in the country where they're going to do the tests. There are lots of rules and regulations that based on the activation you saw in the mouse model and the dose you had there, what is the dose you're going to start with in a human? And typically that first dose is going to be like one tenth or one hundredth or something that you had in the first animal model. So when you first start this, the doses are going to be so small that we don't expect any activation at all. The only problem is that I think that most of those protocols were historically developed based on traditional small drugs. Uh, remember, these small hydrophobic molecules such as aspirin or something. And this is a completely different type of drug. The activation energy, barrier, stability, well, the specificity is much higher here for once. Um, the barriers is probably going to be completely different. The kinetics is completely different. So these traditional safety margins with a factor of 10 or something simply don't hold here. In principle, I think that you could have done this here too, but you should probably have started with a dose that was a million or a billion times lower than you would normally use in the, in the animal model. So, it's one of these cases where hindsight is twenty twenty. When this has happened, I think it's very easy to realize that we're going to need completely different tests for biologicals. Not just that, what you also realize is that since with biologicals you are starting to play with the body's natural immune defense, there are some pretty amazing things we can do, but the same things can also be very scary. And that's simply not something we used to see that extreme in drug development. But that's going to be your job in part. Like when you go out and work at AstraZeneca or Pfizer or Merck or any of these companies, you should be aware not just of what we've told you, because again, hindsight is twenty twenty, but there will likely be other classes of problems like this when we use biologicals that we have no idea how to handle in the future. And sadly, because I don't know what they are, we won't be able to help you with them. But remember that past performance is not an indication of future ones. I think that's all I had for you today, both before the break and then after the break when I re-recorded things here. As always, there are a bunch of study questions here that I'm not going to go through today. But on Monday morning, I suggest we have our normal chat session and work through these 16 ones. And then I'm going to talk more about kinetics of protein folding.